First meeting with Pat and what you thought of him? Well, my first encounter with Pat was over the phone. Uh, I had been told about Pat by Dan Hurley, a jazz educator who was teaching at the National Stage Band camps where he had met Pat and also at uh, Shell Lake Jazz Camp where he had met me. And he told me, he says, you know, there's another guy, a young guitar player from Missouri who you ought to know about. And uh, somehow or another, when I quit college and joined a rock band, we thought we had a record contract and we're going to San Diego for a gig and needed a guitar player, I thought I'd call Pat. And he said, no, I can't do it. I just joined Gary Burton's band. And I was totally blown away and thrilled for him, too, because I had met Gary and really always enjoyed and admired what Gary did. The first time I actually met Pat was after hearing him play with Gary at the Wichita Jazz Festival, and this was in 75, and I was instantly blown away with a combination of Beatles' sense of melody with a completely informed <clears throat> jazz tradition behind it, and it was thrilling and exciting, and I was sold after you know half a solo or half a course of a solo. <laughs> I got to meet him afterwards, and he was uh, very gracious, as he always is, and we vowed to get together at some point, and uh, we did. Yeah, I remember in the old days, I was in some club where he was playing in Boston, and he came back, and he was really excited. He said, I just met this guy. His name's Lyle Mays, and, and, and we're going to form a band together, and we're going to call it 21, because we're both 21 years old. <laughs> Did he ever say that? Yeah, the name didn't stick. Yeah, thank God for <laughs> Good that. Good thing, yeah. yeah. Um, now, it was exciting uh, because I thought I heard in the first few notes that I heard him play uh, a sensibility that I could really relate to, and that has really proven to be true. I mean, we, we have a shared aesthetic on so many, so many areas, on, on so many levels. Uh, I feel incredibly fortunate in that book that's you know got a lot of your compositions with Pat it calls you guys the uh, Lennon and McCartney of jazz or something and, but it would be really interesting for my eager listeners to know something about how people write together and you know how you began to write together and maybe how that's changed over the years well the hardest part about talking about this is that um, there's never really been a pattern uh, the the process is continually evolving, and uh, it's never stayed uh, in one place long enough for me to really know what it is, which may be part of the secret to its longevity. Well, there's nothing you get tired of. But um, about as best I can do is say that it stretches from complete independent development of material that then is presented to the other person to sitting down as close as we are, hammering out note by note what a passage is. So that sort of implies a broad spectrum, which is accurate. And um, beyond that, it would take all week to talk about. That's okay, we have to eat. Um, I know that obviously you're living on different coasts and you both have schedules that are ridiculous, but what do you do? Do you like block out a week when we're going to get together and write or is that the way you, you sort of apportion your time to it? The last big project that we did was uh, the writing of The Way Up hmm. and um, that was again different from anything else we'd ever done, but in that case we had six weeks set aside and I flew to New York and Pat had a, a, a room there right across from the Brill Building where famous songs have been written by Carole King and who knows. It was a great place to be songwriters or composers, however you want to look at it. And we came with nothing, nothing prepared, the vaguest of sketches about what even the project would be. In the first day and a half, 
I'd say, was spent discussing the world at large and politics and the place of music in that and everything else. So we didn't even put pencil to paper at first. Um, and we just basically designed and built this piece from the ground up. Mm. Um, we didn't finish it in those six weeks. We got about two-thirds of the way through and had to coordinate schedules at a later date to, to finish the composition. But that was very interactive. Uh, we used almost no computer-assisted devices. Um, I sat at the piano, Pat sat in a chair, his guitar, and we would take notes on legal pads and pieces of manuscript paper and sort of play our way through our sketches and discuss and to sort of sketch out and design the whole thing. That, was, that's interesting, given the nature of the piece, that you didn't use any computers because, uh, you know, there's a lot of sequence stuff in the, in the overall composition. Well, this was the beginning stages, and I think it was really a good idea because we kept getting the experience of playing the notes and looking at them in a very organic way, very real way, because the computers are fantastic. Uh, you're right, they're all over the record, and we don't shy away from it, but it does add a level of artificiality to the music that you either have to be vigilant in counteracting or harness to certain effects. Um, but at first, I'm just talking about the sketch stage, the, the back of the napkin kind of right. phase. It was all done talking and, you know, making notes on little scraps of paper. The piece is, well, it uses certainly a great deal of pedal points all over the place. And it also uses what I can only term as metric pedal points as well as actual you, note pedal points. What do you mean by metric? Well, what I mean is, for instance, a, a pedal point will be going ding, 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 and then, you know, actually you're in four to start with, and then suddenly you're in seven or something, but the pedal point keeps going through. So in other words, it's just like a... Oh, simple a, repetitive rhythm. Simple repetitive, yes, yeah, and also repetitive note, you know. So yeah. that's a large part of the piece, not all of it, of course, but there, there is a lot of the piece that uses that pedal point idea. And also, I mean, Pat said to me before... He loves the thing of just playing an E forever and then going from A minor to F. And, you know, he could do that for six months and be happy. <laughs> so, uh, so what I'd like you to do, if you can, just on this uh, high school piano here that we're sitting in front of, uh, it would be really great if you could explain to the little listeners that I have out there the nature of the pedal point and how it's used in the different ways in, in that piece. I'd be happy to do that, but it is a little bit like explaining... A meal by talking about the basil. I'm happy to do it, but it's, it's okay. not what makes it nutritious. No, I know that. I'm I'm very aware of that. Just but as it, long as I, I get no. That okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean it's 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 an aspect of the piece, but I, it just would be fun if you could uh, just give a little bit of an example so that the ordinary person out there, instead of the sophisticated musicians out there, you know, most of my audience are people who love music but they're not musicians. So it would be fun for them to see, well, this is what it does, and this is how we used it in this little example. Okay, hit me, big boy. <laughs> so the, the way up is basically hung around uh, two themes or kernels, and they're, they're very small. Um, they're almost like musical molecules. And the first one is a, a diatonic... Uh, and that can be actually reduced to its atom of and at the end at the end of the first statement of the theme you hear that atom one of its isotopes in uh, retrograde form and closely related to that is the less blues scale more major scale version so basically we have this three note idea and that three note idea. Between those two kernels much material is, is, is drawn. Virtually the melodic material for an entire 70 minute piece of music. The way this all started is that Pat had written this melody that had uh, what we both agreed was a hookish quality. And it was... It 
etc. And it's just hummable, memorable, um, but we had never found really a place for it. And uh, it's like we had this diamond and the setting it was in wasn't really up to the quality of the stone. So it had been floating around for years, undeniably good, strong, memorable, all those things that a hook needs to have, but it didn't find its home until we stopped thinking about songwriting and, and started thinking about composition. Then when that melodic idea became a theme rather than the melody, the gates of creativity seemed to open up a lot. And um, when it ended up happening is it got reharmonized, it got turned inside out, upside down, used as counter melodies, it led to, to secondary themes. And uh, well, you'd have to listen to the piece and look at the score to, to really see all that's going on there. But um, in that particular case, thinking of it not as a melody, but a, a little more atomically as a, as a kernel, uh, turned out to be productive. It sure did, and you've just done a perfect thing for my melody program. What the hell, I might as well just get you to give an answer because everybody else has. What is melody anyway? Well, it's an impossible question. Um, I've been thinking about it since that's the theme of this program, and about all I can say is that apparently, I can't say what it is, but I can observe that evidently it takes less and less these days to produce a melody. We've become much more productive, uh, where in the past you needed years of musical training to craft a melody. Apparently now you only need a week or you know a fancy synth, and <laughs> instead of years to develop the ability to appreciate a melody, you can now do it with a first or second grade education. So we've, we've become much more productive. We need fewer notes to make a melody. We need fewer chords. It's a triumph of modern capitalism. <laughs> yes, well, thank you for that. And uh, I'm, so, I, you know, no, I, didn't, that, I didn't answer your question because no, it's impossible no, to I, answer. No, I love the way you answered it because that's the kind of answer that I was hoping for from you. It got politics and a little bit of invective subtly underneath a little. I that's, can't help it. No, I know, I know. I love that in you. I've always loved that. Radio Richard.